Hello, and welcome to the Woodrow Wilson House Lunch and Learn Speaker Series. My name is Elizabeth Karcher, and it's my pleasure to have you today. We're going to have Dr. Erica Coleman speak to us today about her book, uh, That the Blood Stay Pure. And uh, but first, we'd like to tell you a little bit about what's going on at the Woodrow Wilson House. We continue with Suffrage Outside. It is extended for another month, and we're hoping that you'll make plans to come see us. It's open every day, extended hours on Thursday until 6 p.m. It's free on Tuesdays. It is uh, open seven days a week, so please go online and book your time to come visit us. For those of you um, who are new to our Zoom program uh, at lunch, we will uh, dark out your screen. We will put you on mute. Uh, Dr. Coleman and I will I'll introduce her. We'll have a, a talk, and then we'll open the chat session for you to send in your questions or comments, and we will um, I'll address them to Dr. Coleman. So Dr. Erica Coleman is an award-winning, nationally recognized American historian and independent scholar whose research focuses on comparative ethnic studies and issues of racial formation and identity. Her additional research interests include indigeneity, immigration, migration, interracial relations, mixed race identity, race and gender intersections, sexuality, the politics of race and science, and popular culture. She received her doctorate in American studies from the Union Institute and University in 2005. She completed her postdoctoral fellowship in scholarly information resources and Africana studies at Johns Hopkins University. She was also a summer Mellon Fellow for the Future of Minority Studies Consortium at Cornell University. She's had, held faculty appointments in Africana Studies at Widener in University, the University of Delaware, and Johns Hopkins University. She has been a faculty facilitator for the UNCF Mellon Faculty Fellows Domestic Summer Institute. She has spoken far and wide at a number of other institutes across the states. Um, she has lectured and presented papers at academic and public venues, including the Organization of American Historians, the American Historical Association, the Associ Association for the Study of African American Life and History, MIT's Conference on Race and Science, the National Holocaust Museum, the Virginia Forum, and now today, the Woodrow Wilson House. She has lent her expertise on matters of race and ethnicity to the Virginia General Assembly House Rules Committee, NPR, the Washington Post, the New York Times, Time Magazine, and many other uh, articles and publications. Dr. Coleman's first book, that the blood stay pure, African Americans, Native Americans, and the predicament of race and identity in Virginia. A choice outstanding academic title for 2014 traces the history and legacy of Virginia's efforts to maintain racial purity and the consequences of this almost 400 year effort on African American, Native American relations and kinship bonds in the Commonwealth. With that, I would like to introduce Dr. Erica Coleman. Welcome, and thank you for joining us today during this important month of Native American Heritage Month. Uh, so our pleasure to have you here. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I apologize for being a little late coming in. You know, now we're here, and we're here in this crazy, Mm, what should I say? Oh, what a country. I'll put it that way. Oh, what a country. And what this country is, is a paradox. It is. It's a paradox. Because who would have thunk, <laughs> as we say in my community, who would have thunk that we would elect Joe Biden from Delaware. And um, the, there's that, you know, that running joke about, you know, Delaware. Okay, I don't think anybody's gonna be doing that anymore. I'm gonna come for you 
if you do that again, because now you know where Delaware is. I mean, people just drive through, you know. So now we have a we have a president elect from Delaware. So now you all know where Delaware is. I mean, all eyes was on Delaware on Saturday night when um, he and Pres Vice President elect Kamala Harris made their acceptance speeches. Um, and no, I was not downtown. I stayed here safely in my house um, and watched it from the television. Um, but we live in some very interesting times. And you know, this country has always been very interesting anyway, um, to say the least. But it's interesting to me, um, two things, that while we were waiting for the election results, you know, you had the exit polls that were coming out. Then plus you had this article that came out in a number of um, newspapers that talked about the schism within the, the Democratic Party. I'm just letting you guys know the things that keep me up at night. So, you know, I mean, I did allow myself to, I did allow myself to, you know, celebrate some. But then, you know, we need to walk in what King said about 11 months before he was assassinated. He said, we need to walk in a sober realism. And the, what's interesting is that, is that um, there was this call, there was this press call on, th on Thursday. I mean, before, you know, all the votes were counted. And you know you have your establishment or what you call your centrist Democrats who were blaming the progressive Democrats for losing seats in the House. And it's just interesting to me because you know I said when you know this ticket came together first first Biden and then uh, Kamala, um, this is not a progressive ticket. This is a conservative ticket. And so, you know, what we have to do is, is not just vote, but the activism has to continue. We have a lot of work to do. Um, 70 million people voted to reelect Donald Trump. That is something to be said. I just want to talk about this paradox. I mean, this election was so close. And this is what's keeping me up at night. How can that be? Mm -hmm. How can it be that when you look at the exit polls, once again, you know, um, Biden did not win the, the white vote. As usual, as usual. And in this 100th year of celebrating um, women, and that's specifically white women getting um, the franchise, um, which, was, which, which was hard won, still 54% of white women voted for Donald Trump. We, we cannot ignore this. So while people are talking about, you know, having this kumbaya moment, we're going to have to realize that this is who we are. This is the country that we live in, a very conservative, a country that still is struggling with um, embracing universal voting rights for all. I mean, to see people at a um, uh, polling place, you know, outside praying that the votes would be stopped or, you know, the, all the shenanigans that went on so that, you know, certain populations of people would not be able to vote because of the fear of the outcome this is the paradox that we are in because so many of us still 
believe, or at least we say we believe in the ideals that this country was founded on. Now understand, we the people did not include most of the people. And so it did not include African Americans, it did not include Native Americans, it did not include women of any color. Okay, it did, not, it did not include, you know, poor whites. So, you know, we're still trying to expand this definition of we the people because, I mean, I'm going to say it, we have an electoral college that just needs to be abolished. It, 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 need, it, just, it just needs to go because we're sitting here biting our fingers, you know, waiting for the guy who's won the most votes wondering if, he, if he's gonna win the election. The same thing with Hillary Clinton in 2016. Hillary Clinton should be going into her second term, actually. However, we have the way that this system is set up is such a mess that, you know, we're gonna have to do something you know, or we're going to keep, you know, doing this same thing. And I don't know about your heart, but my heart can't take this. <laughs> this is a whole lot. Now, you said, well, this is Native American history. Well, if you're supposed to talk about your book, oh, yeah, I'm going to talk about the book. I'm going to talk about the book. And that, again, goes to this issue of the American paradox and how we situate bodies, how we say, you go here, you go here, you know, you, you hear a lot now about identity politics, but that's really what founded this country, okay? Who belonged and who did not, okay? And so let me say this because this is, this is, Ameri this is Native American History Month and we just celebrated, for some people, it was Columbus Day. For other people, it was Indigenous Peoples Day. Okay, now I, I'm just gonna be right clear with you. I'm on the side of Indigenous Peoples Day. I celebrate Indigenous Peoples Day, okay? Um, not only because I am um, African-American and Native American Repahannock Indian, yes, I know. And when people say to me, because they look at me and they're like, you don't look like an Indian. That's because you watch too much Turner Classic TV. <laughs> Turn that TV off. <laughs> Turn that TV off. <laughs> but Turner Classic TV really has us, really, you know, has so, you know, ingrained in our minds, you know, what it means to be an Indian, what an Indian looks like. You know, and you know, they walk around in buckskin and bees and feathers all day and the whole nine yards. And that's not true. And I've been in situations where um, a friend, particularly a friend of mine who is uh, the chief of the Nottaway Indian tribe of Virginia, they are, they are, they are Afro Indian. Okay, they would not deny um, the, other, the other part of them or any part of them. They're also white. They're also, I mean, they, they, they mix and match with people. You know, this is, this, is, this is what we do. And understand folk that in the, what they call interracial marriage, that is the exception. Interracial sex is the rule. So no matter, you know, how much we have, you know, had these, you know, what we call anti-miscegenation laws. Um, which was originally called, you know, used the term amalgamation, so-called mixing of the races. Um, and, you know, all of these prescriptions, you know, against that, what I, what I call, it's, it's what I call the study of boinkology. And it's, you know, people who are saying, you know, the powers that be, okay, you know, in order to keep the blood pure, okay, Okay, you can boink with that person, but you can't boink with that person. <laughs> or boinkology, <laughs> okay. So, you know, we have set these rules up, but you know, people have been boinking back and forth and it doesn't make a difference how many laws you set up. 
people are not going to um, adhere to those laws. So then the interesting thing, even from the very beginning, when there was, you know, this idea of, you know, keeping the white race pure, there were no prescriptions against African American and Native American people. As I say, boinking. <laughs> you know, cohabitating, coming together, having children together. I'm trying, I'm trying to, I'm trying to keep this PG. So, um, <laughs> so the interesting thing is that um, you had, you know, the English who came to Virginia, really was called Sina Kumaka. And actually this was known as Turtle Island. Okay, not Virginia, so they didn't come to Virginia. Um, they came to Sina Kamaka. No, I'm not going to try to spell that for you. Mm -mm. Let's move on. <laughs> so they came to Sina Kamaka. Okay, and then you had uh, the Puritans, um, the pilgrims that came uh, to the uh, Massachusetts Bay Area. Again, Edward Island. Um, who didn't come here to this continent was Christopher Columbus. He never stepped foot on what we now know as North America. He did not. And so, you know, how, well, how do, how do we get into this whole thing of celebrating, you know, Columbus Day? Real quick, um, the Italians who were treated awful here when they first came here. You know, if you were from Southern or Eastern Europe, you were not considered white, what we were what we were dealing with and have been dealing with is really Anglo-Saxon superiority, okay? So then, you know, if you were not from uh, the North and the West, then you were, not, you were not considered white when you came to the United States. And so the Italians were treated horribly as a way, as all groups did, to come under this umbrella of whiteness, then Basically, you know, they, they made deals. They made deals. And so actually the Italian community lobbied FDR to make Columbus Day a national holiday. And it had been celebrated like for the, for the 300th anniversary, okay? But it was not a national holiday until 1937, okay? So then that's how, that's how we got that day off. Okay, or, or some of us, not all of us, but that's that's why we observe. But, but it was because of the lobbying. But again, Columbus never stepped foot here. So you know, we call this period, this historical period that we're living in now, we call it a time of reckoning. But there's always been a time of reckoning in the United States because there's always been this pushback. People just did not accept labels, did not accept their condition of slavery or, you know, indentured servitude. People, it is human nature to resist. Now, some did. Some did. I mean, people negotiate these spaces any, any kind of way that they think is going to benefit them. But then you had some, you know, who became Christians and you know, told the line, the whole nine yards, if there was gonna be an insurrection, they would tell the powers that be. This is what happened with Denmark Vesey, okay? And that insurrection. So this is what happened with, you know, Gabriel Posner and that insurrection. You know, somebody, as we used to say back in the day, dropped the line, okay? And then they were rewarded for that, you know, for being, you know, this, 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 you know, good and faithful servant. But then there were a lot of people, and one of the things that we don't talk about are the many insurrections that happened during the time of slavery. And this is really important because, guess what, folks? The first slave insurrection happened in Virginia in 1701. 
when African Americans and Native Americans got together. And yes, those Native Americans were slaves. That's another part of the story that people miss out on. Black people were not, the first slaves in this hemisphere were the indigenous population here. Now, people like to say, oh, well, that didn't quite work out because, you know, they had a, a, a weaker constitution. Well, then they brought Africans in because they had a stronger constitution. Also, you know, I mean, in other words, you know, African people were more fit, were more physically fit to endure um, the, um, the, 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 the violence of slavery. But the interesting thing is that and the other story that's told is that, um, well, the Native American people, they knew the land. So because they knew the land, then they could easily escape. Well, that's if you were kept in the same vicinity where you lived. But that is not what happened. African peoples and Native American peoples were both on the auction block. Being sold on the auction block, you had, and just like, you know, you had a certain um, African tribes that worked with the various, you know, um, uh, European factions, the Dutch, the British, the English, the Spanish, in order to, you know, capture Africans and, you know, get them to, uh, uh, the Atlantic, so they can be transported, you know, to um, various parts of the Americas. Actually, the United States received less um, enslaved Africans than, say, Latin America and and the Caribbean and all of these other places. Okay, but I mean, we don't think that because you know, right now we're the center of the world. Let me also remind you that you know we are only. 5% of the world's population. Think about that. The United States is only 5% of the world's population. So the thing that we credit Columbus for is that when he sailed the ocean blue and he got lost and found himself what we call butt naked last in the Americas. And why do we say that? Because there were people who were already here. I don't see how you can discover something when somebody else has already has already been there for eons and eons and eons. Okay, so this is you know and, and, and this is the myth that people are pushing back upon. Now, one more thing about Columbus is interesting because go back to the first grade. Think about the first grade when you were taught about Columbus, and you know your teacher stood there, you know, and said. Oh, you know, with those long pointers or whatever that they used to they, 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 that they used to have, and you know, he or she told you, "Oh, yes, Christopher Columbus discovered America because when when he, where he was from, everybody believed the world was flat." And he said, "No, the world is round. I'm going to prove it to you." So he gets in, you know, his ship, and then brings two others with him. And, you know, he discovers, of course, that the world is indeed round. That is not what Christopher Columbus said. Everybody knew the world was round. In his day, everybody knew to go read the writings of Christopher Columbus. Everybody believed that the world was round. Christopher Columbus wrote back to Spain and said, for all of you who believe that the world is round, you're wrong. The world is shaped like a woman's breast and I am sailing towards the nipple. That is what he said. Now, of course, you can't teach that to first graders. I know my mother would have been upset. You said what? <laughs> and my mother was always up at the school. You think, no, that was not gonna happen. Okay, but what we do know about Columbus is that his so-called discovery actually brought numerous peoples together and, and, and really started this 
um, really expanded the Atlantic slave trade and then merged that slave trade with the Native American slave trade because the Indians began to uh, partner with various uh, factions. Like you had the West Coast up in the Hudson area and they partnered with the English. Now, here's the problem with, you know, well, they, the Indians knew the land. Not if you're being transported from uh, the Hudson all the way to Florida, to the Caribbean, to Europe, to West Africa. Let that sink in, to West Africa. So these folks were being just like African peoples were being transported and no matter you know where they ran, you, you were still in America, okay? The same thing happened with Native Americans. So understand that the relationship or the contact, the initial contact between African peoples and Native American peoples was forged under settler colonialism. And Native peoples saw African peoples as interlopers just as they saw Europeans as interlopers. And they wanted their country back. Okay, let's just be real about it. But, you know, what happened, of course, is that what is interesting is that, um, and, and, and let me just say this too, there is no monolithic African, you know, people, there are no monolithic Native American people. You know, you had a lot of different nations, okay? They had different languages, different religions, okay? Um, different customs. Okay, so, you know, when Europeans try to um, absolve themselves of slavery, you know, they'll say, well, you know, African people sold their own people into slavery. Well, yes and no. Yes and no. Depending on whose viewpoint you're going from. If you're going from a, a worldview of a European who just thinks that, you know, everybody is connected and the same based on phenotype, based on, you know, the area of, um, of initial contact. Well, yes, you, you, you can say that, I guess that's fair, but that's wrong because there is no identity, collective identity. So even today, as we look, even as we look at this election, you know, everybody did not vote the same. There were some black people who voted for Trump just as there were who voted for, you know, Biden. There were some Latinos who went for Trump, who also, and others who went for Biden. You understand what I'm saying? That there's never been, and there are women. We always talk about women voting as a block. No, women have never voted as a block, okay? Um, some people think that it's gonna happen one day. I don't think so, because people are, people are different. People are different, and, and, and this, this dressing of um, you know woman does not mean to does not mean the same to everyone. The same thing with being African and being Native American. You have, these were you know very specific nations that were just clumped into one. Okay, so when we get to Virginia, when we get to um, uh, uh, the, the Powhatan people and a number of others. Remember, this is it's a problem when people try to make it seem like that before the white man came, there was tranquility and peace, and we all now nah, you did. Okay, you had your love together, you fought together, you had enemy tribes, and this is how the Europeans were so in instrumental and getting this um, uh, divine rule down pat because people were enemies. So then, you know, I'm gonna, did you help me to fight these enemy Indians? Absolutely. You know, same thing in Africa. Would you help me to, you know, subdue this, 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 this particular tribe? Absolutely. Because you didn't see each other as one. So then there was no collective black, no collective white, no collective red, 
Okay, all of that, all of that came with the um, invention of whiteness. Okay, because you could no longer use religion. Because if you have Indian people and, and African people becoming Christians, how are you going to keep them enslaved? How are you going to keep them, you know, on reservations? Okay, and so this is what happened in Virginia. The Virginia Indians saw black people as interlopers the same way that they did white people initially. Mm -hmm. But then alliances became or began to forge because once they really got to interact with each other and began to understand each other and the language barrier um, was taken care of, then they realized how much they culturally had in common. And so then these alliances were forced, okay? So then people are, you know, coming together, people are, you know, marrying and cohabitating in the whole nine yards. And see, then what the English population did, they were like, oh no, wait a minute. So, you know, I mentioned very briefly this 1701 um, insurrection that happened in Virginia with African Americans and Native Americans who were saying, we have had enough of this. Okay. Now, here is how the animosity came about again. Because these two people were um, mixing, and mixing and mingling, okay then what the powers that be said was, oh, you've been mixing with these Africans, so then you are no longer Indian. And therefore you have no right to this land. You have, you have forfeited your right to the land. And so then this is what began to happen in Virginia, this land grab, okay? Um, the Gangaskin were first, which happened in the early 19th century. But the, the effort to take their reservation started around 1783. Okay. But then by um, 1811, they had lost their reservation. Now, here's the other thing. So not only are they losing their reservation and they're losing their identity as Indian people, that meant they, they could also be enslaved. And so you, you had people, so we're talking the Eastern Shore, that's what the Gaskin were. Well, the folks on the mainland, they look in and they're like, oh no. And so by the late 19th century, and, and then there was still this effort of, of trying to take the land. I'm gonna, I'm gonna mention briefly the Pamunkey Indians because they were the first Powhatan people who received federal recognition in 2016. Okay, and what, what, what people call, um, famously called Pocahontas' people. Okay, but finally they got federally recognized. Well, they tried to take their reservation, same reason, in the 1840s and they had to defend against that. So then by uh, the 1880s, the Pamunkey had um, put together their um, bylaws and the whole nine yards. And the first bylaw was, you cannot intermarry with Negroes. You can only marry white. And that's been the um, rule ever since. And so then what I do is in that the blood stay pure, I look at that history from uh, the, the, the early beginnings of the Virginia colony up until about um, 19, uh, -uh 2020, 2012, I've been talking about 2012, okay? Because people need to understand how people internalize, how people internalize um, the racist values of the of mainstream America. Now, and, and this, is a, this is an issue and a problem that is coast to coast. I talk about Virginia, okay? Mm -hmm. This is out West. This is, you know, 
in the Northeast, okay? But that's not to say that every tribe does that, okay? The, the, the last chapter in my book, um, the, the, the Nottaway Indian tribe of Virginia, okay? I'm just gonna say this two minutes. The Indian Native American tribe of Virginia, those were the folks who got, received state recognition but they refused to deny that they had African ancestry. They said, we have African ancestry, we have white ancestry, and probably some others, and we are Indian people, but we're not gonna deny all that who we are. Same thing with the Shinnecock in New York, in, in Southampton, New York, okay? They spent like 30 years trying to get federally recognized and one of their biggest problems was because they, they refused to deny blackness. So this is all to say that, because I know we're also in the, 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 the science age, I, can't, I don't have time to get into it, and the, the, the DNA age. And to be quite frank with you, there is no test to tell you if you are or are not Native American. There is no test to tell you where you came from in Africa. It's not, it's not. It's, it's a multi-billion dollar hoax is what it is. It's recreational science. So when people tell me, well, I took a DNA test, really? And it said, okay, you know, but that's not race, who we are. When we check that box is because of what the federal government has determined, not by anything that is flowing in your veins. Because from the lightest light to the darkest dark, and remember in 2000 was, you know, that, that big controversy about the census. And are we going to um, have a mixed race category? And I'm like, sure. And everybody checked that box, everybody. <laughs> Everybody, I don't care who you are, I don't care where you're from, I don't care what you look like, check. Because we are all somehow, there's no such thing as a pure race, there's no such thing as race. We are all the human race. But what has happened in the last 400, 500 years is this, you know, uh, 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 ins inserting or inscribing onto bodies by these very superficial um, appearances. You know, your phenotype, you know, okay, so you're black and you're white and you're this and you're that. And it's interesting, and I'm, I'm gonna close with this. It's very interesting because when, uh, uh, I'm back, that gorgeous woman man killer, that's it. Woman man killer, who was um, the modern day first female principal chief of the Cherokee um, of Oklahoma. She said, one of the things that surprised me when I came to the South was that I saw people who identified as African-American. She said, but I can look at them and tell, you're Crete, you're Cherokee, you're Seminole, you're Oneida, you're, mm -hmm. and she said, the problem is that because of the acceptance of the relationship between whites and Indians and that you can be white and still be, and of Indian heritage and still be Indian. But, and this goes to, again, definitions, but you know, you've heard of that term, the one drop rule. Okay, one drop of black blood makes you black. And fortunately, I mean, that is, I mean, it's the biggest myth because there's no such thing as black blood. There's no such thing as, as, as white blood. There's no such thing. If we all pinch our fingers, I'm not gonna have you do it. If I say everybody pinch your finger and squeeze, you know what's gonna come out? Everybody gonna be red. The only thing that's different is some of you are gonna be A and some of you are gonna be, you know, O positive. That's the only difference. So this whole invention of race has us reeling and going still to this day. But be clear, it's not biology, it's politics. So as Stuart Hall said, 
when you think about race, think less about biology and more about politics. But understand, it's the politics of race that has kept us divided, that has kept us fighting, that has kept us apart. Mm-hmm. Myth of it. And I'm gonna stop right there. Thank you. That very, uh, as I, I've read your, it is uh, brave statements. It is boldly written, boldly, boldly argued. And so we thank you for that. Um, and sometimes this is such a taboo conversation, a taboo topic. So one of the goals we, that we have on these uh, lunch and learn is to bring up subjects that we might not necessarily have learned in, in uh, school. And so I thank you, Dr. Coleman, for enlightening us on, on um, your approach and your ideas. I Some questions have come in. Um, one is on, on this sense of if you uh, have these established hierarchies within these groups and there's not a question of race, then why, why do we use the word or why do Native Americans use the word tribe? Well, that's a, actually, that's, a, that, that's again a European imposition, the term tribe, okay? Because they, 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 they refer to themselves as first peoples, nations, they did not refer to themselves as tribe until European contact. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah. Then do Native Americans consider themselves uh, pure within their, within their jurisdictions, I, I, the, this, within their no, tribe? I understand, I understand. See, that, yes. Only if they maintain, now see, again, all of this, this is why we have to talk about settler colonialism, because all of this became a reality as a part of settler colonialism where identities were shifted. I mean, like I said, there was no such thing as a red race, okay? And it took up until about the late 18th century for native people to begin to to refer to themselves as red people, okay? But the truth is, is that, I mean, it's Indian. I mean, let's be real about it. Columbus was lost and was wrong, but, you know, we give him a pass and, you know, we, we call these folks Indians, we call the people in India Indians, <laughs> You know, and then in the Caribbean, oh, that, that, that's the, they're the West Indies. That's the West Indies. There was no such thing as that before. So this is what I'm saying. Well, that- I think one of our questions came in and this, this relates to this. If you don't have that etymology, if you don't have the use of words, how do you have this discussion? How do you have, uh, these are problems. We face these problems when we talk about race. But if you don't use certain terms to describe the issues, how do you, what's your definition or what's your solution for a language on discussing race? Oh, oh, yes, thank you. (laughs) That is a most excellent question because understand that race works like a language. Toni Morrison talked about what the, the, the difficulty, the struggle that she had with using a language that was embedded with, you know, discrimination and hierarchies and the whole nine yards. And so this is how, you know, race continues to operate like a language, okay? And so, you know, I mean, you, you take the word, you know, like Negro, okay? That term comes from the Spanish, right? Okay, the English adopted it, but here's the thing. The English adopted it and they called people who were Native American Negro. There was no designation for Indian in the United States up until the 1870 census. So from 1790 census on up, this is why people particularly in the East who are looking for that I designation, you're not gonna find it. 
And so we use language to kind of determine the temperature. This is why when people were saying that, you know, um, Trump's rhetoric was irrelevant, it's not true. Because of the fact that we use the language in order to reinforce these levels of hierarchy. And so then what, we, what we're trying to do is, is what Morrison says, free up the language. And how do we free that language up? We interrogate. We interrogate that. So, you know, where do we get, where, where do we get the term whiteness? You know, how did that come about? Because white people did not colonize these, these different places. Now the Dutch did, the Swedes did, you know, the English did, you, you see what I'm saying? We lose that specificity. So then we use this language in order to make things look natural and normal. Let me give you a, a real quick example. When Ronald Reagan came in to office, okay, and this is like right on the, 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 the end of civil rights movement, okay, you went from the civil rights to this whole colorblind ideology. All he did was change the language. So, you know, you, you say, you, you, know, you don't say black, you say, you don't say the N word, you say urban. So I, I have to say in when, uh, when you talk and there's a, a European, maybe a white centric or an American or English centric saying, and that is one language, one person, two languages, two people. That is seen as a compliment to someone. It is seen as, as, as something that says, you speak two languages, you actually have two identities, two uh, understandings, two sensi sensibilities. Mm -hmm. uh, what I'm hearing is that using that is actually almost a negative in your in this world of um, having this identity, having that, do you see the difference? Yes, but, but, this, but, but this, is, this is the politics. This is the politics. But that's not, when they say that about uh, one language, one person, two languages, two people, that's not about politics. That's actually saying that somebody's mind is broadened. They, they see the world from two different perspectives as, as someone who's an English speaker, speaker or someone who's a Franco, you know, a Francophone. So, yes, yes, so but, that's not, but that's not mainstream. That is not a mainstream thought. This is why you still have people running around, you know, with this English only you know, having English only, you know, movements and the whole nine yards. Language is political. In fact, the first thing that you do as a colonizer is to go in and change the language mm -hmm. and impose your language and your sense of who, of, of, of who people are. This is why the whole idea of, you know, there's, you know, these people are, 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 are African, all these people are African, you know, then all these people are white. And then all these people of this and that and the other thing, you know, this is a result of settler colonialism where people had their identities altered. You think about how people um, refer to Native Americans, okay? And it's always some degree. Oh, well, my, my great, great grandmother was full-blooded Cherokee. Now, and I'm not talking about your great, great grandmother. I will tell you though, that she was full of blood, as we all are. I, I can tell you that. Full-blooded Cherokee? Nah. No, there was no, there's no such thing. There's no such thing. But this is the way that we talk about Native people. Well, I'm a quarter, okay? The whole issue of blood quantum, okay? That's, that's a European imposition. That is not, this is not what these folks have said about themselves, but this is what they have internalized. This is what they have internalized. And mm -hmm. what they are finding is that their internalization of this is to their own detriment because they cannot marry, you know, I mean, you have to really do that math. And, you know, and, you know, you did ask me um, um, for a, um, for a slide and I wish that I had, I had shown this one slide and that is the slide when Thomas Jefferson, just look it up. There's a letter from Thomas Jefferson to Francis Gray. And I believe it's 1805 when he, when he asked, how do you go from mulatto to white? 
Mm -hmm. He has this whole algebraic formula. You know how to, you, when you see, you know, on TV, when the teachers write all this stuff all over the board and you're like, okay, am I supposed to copy all this? You know, but it looks like something from, you know, like MIT, or MIT math class or something. That's what this, is, <laughs> that's what this looks like. You know, so the language is important because it is political, but also you have to interrogate the language. And that's a lot of what I do. So it's not to see people take the language for granted, okay? And because language naturalizes and normalizes these things. But once you get under there and interrogate the language, then you can really begin to chisel out you know, and of course you have to have a historical context too, to go along with that. But, you know, um, uh, Jabari Asim, we were, some of us, I'm, I'm sure not all of us, um, Chappelle's uh, SNL opening was a travesty to a lot of us this past weekend, you know, and his use of the N word. And, you know, if I knew where he lived, I would send him Jabari Asim's book the N-word, who should say it, who shouldn't, and why. Because he gives such a great um, history of language and the use of language, and it's... And very important to have uh, use of language in America and, and to get a sense of who we are as Americans. Yes. So uh, we thank you for that, Dr. Coleman. Uh, and Sarah Andrews, thank you very much. You've put up the letters of the founders on the archive uh, so you can see the documents and the registration. We thank all of our audience for tuning in today. We appreciate it. Uh, as I said, this is to open our minds, uh, learn something that we didn't know about before and uh, to explore new understandings. Uh, the one thing that I will say about the friends and, uh, and supporters of the Wilson House is that you are intellectually curious and that is why we bring these types of talks to you. If you're interested in supporting and uh, sponsoring the series for in the spring, please contact me. Otherwise, I hope to see you in the garden. Come and see suffrage outside. I hope to see you outside taking walks uh, in this beautiful weather in the Calorama neighborhood, in the Wadi Butler Wood. Uh, and if you're interested in having parties, we have been using the rear garden for the suffrage outside to host cocktail parties, safe outside um, and events. So if you're thinking about the next best setting for an event, um, please contact us for that as well. Thank you all very much and have a great week. Bye. And happy uh, Native American uh, History Month. <laughs> Thank Bye, you, Dr. Coleman. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you.